I'd like you to take a look at John chapter 1, please. We're going to begin here. We're going to be speaking about uh, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the number of his name. The number of his name. Jesus and the number of his name. And I'd just like to take a look at John chapter 1, verse 1, a familiar passage of Scripture here. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That word, if you take a look at it in the Hebrew and even in the Greek as well, both languages, both Hebrew and Greek, with every letter that, that, that they had in their, in their alphabet, with every letter that they had, there was always a number that was associated with the letter. There was a letter that was a number that was associated with the letter. So, with, uh, you know, if, in the English language, if I say A to you, it really has no meaning other than A itself. I mean, if I, don't, if I don't connect it with other letters and create a little word with those other letters, then the letter A in and of itself doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, if you say, say say B, you would take a look at me and say, what in the world are you trying to say to me? B, B what? B, you know, you would try to add some let other words to it or other letters to it to create a word. But not so in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, they were, every letter had a number to it. And the interesting thing was, was that it not only had a number, it also had a picture. So if I just gave you one letter of the Hebrew alphabet, or even of the Greek alphabet, the Hebrew more precisely because they had pictures that were connected to them, I could give you one Hebrew letter, and you'd understand volumes of what God was trying to say to you just through one letter, because one letter could, mean, could have a number that's attached to it, and the number could have a picture, has a picture attached to it. That picture could have meant just about anything that you, exactly how the Spirit of God wanted you to understand it. So, for example, if you take a look at, the, at, this, at, the, uh, at Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning. That word beginning there is actually the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The second letter of the Hebrew alphabet had the picture of a house to it. So what God was saying, he was saying, in the beginning when I created everything, I was actually creating a house for myself. That's just in understanding the letters and the numbers that are associated to them. So, so by understanding the numbers associated with the letters, it really brings out the beauty and the awesomeness of what God was really saying in, his, in the Bible. Now, there's something rather unique about when you use numbers. is that you're, you're reading a Bible right now. You're reading in English. The original language that was used was used in Hebrew. And actually, the Hebrew language that the Bible was written in was called a dead language, meaning if you go to Israel right now, they're not speaking the same Hebrew that, they, that the Bible was written in. It's a completely and total, totally different kind of Hebrew, excuse me, that they were speaking. They weren't speaking the kind of Hebrew that, that, that the Bible spoke. It's actually a dead language, what they consider to be a dead language. But the interesting thing is, is this, is that you can change languages, and matter of fact, once you translate a language, you already lose a lot of part of the meaning. Did you know that? Do you know that once you take the Hebrew, that's why I say to people, if you want to get the true understanding of what your Bible is saying, pick up some basic fundamental tools that are used to help you understand and will help you explain what the original language means. You don't have to be a Hebrew scholar or a Greek scholar or go into any, you know, that if you want to just find out some simple things, pick up a Strong's Concordance, pick up a lexicon and understand at least what the original words meant in their original form. Because the moment you translate a language, you immediately downgrade the meaning of that language. I say that again? The moment you take the Hebrew language and translate it into English, you're not getting the pure essence of what that word really, really meant. It's been, it's been watered down a little bit. I mean, we get, we're getting the understanding of it. I mean, it's still there. God's word is still God's word. But the reality is some of it has been watered down. So in order to get a more precise meaning, a more understandable meaning, we go to, we go to these tools that are available to us, such as the strong concordance or some other tools that are avail to, available to us, like lexicons. Now, again, you don't have to be some, some, uh, some deep student of the Bible to have this you don't really have to be any student of the Bible at all. Just pick up your concordance and stuff will give it to you. And you'll be amazed how God will minister to you. You'll be surprised how God will minister to you just through the understanding of the meanings of the words. But again, once you take a language and translate it, 
you automatically, right there, just from the translation itself, you're watering it down. I mean, some of, some of the intent and some of the meaning automatically has been lost just by the translation itself. So, but the interesting, I said all that to say this, is that even though the language could be watered down because of the translation, numbers cannot. Numbers remain as numbers no matter where you go. For example, what 20 means to us today is exactly what 20 means to, to any place you go in the world. You don't even understand, have to read, you don't have to understand Chinese. But yet if you tell number 20 to them, they understand what 20 is. 20 is 20 no matter where you go on the face of the earth. Matter of fact, you can go back thousands of years and 20 will still be 20. So even though you can change a language, you can't change a number. And when you begin to see this and realize this, you begin to realize and understand that the, the, the wisdom that God took in putting the numbers in the language themselves. Because if you lose anything of the word in of itself, the awesomeness and the beauty of the numbers can always be seen just through what you're reading. So uh, we as believers should have at least a basic understanding of what these numbers mean and what these numbers uh, speak about because you'd be surprised. Just as God will use a word to minister to you, he'll use a number to minister to you. Uh, you may, may be driving down the highway and all of a sudden see a number pop up. You'd be surprised what God, how God will speak to you in your spirit just by seeing that number, that God will use it to speak something into your heart. But if you don't understand what that number means, if it's just a number to you, then God can't, God can't put that in your spirit, what he wanted to say. But if you understand what it means, you'd be surprised what God will give to you in the meaning of those things. Now, now just as your vocabulary of words should grow, your vocabulary of understanding numbers should grow alongside with that as well. And isn't it interesting? I mean, I mean, we, we may have lost the beauty of this, but guess what? Those, those that are in the occult, they haven't lost it because everything about the occult is numbers. I mean, everything is twisted. Everything is, is, is demonic. Everything is satanic. But, but they understand the principle of it. That's why a lot of things that they do is, 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 is found in, hidden in numbers. But now, if, you, if, this is, if this is the truth concerning these numbers, uh, concerning that the, he, the Hebrew letters have got a picture to them, and the picture associated with them is the number, the basic uh, question should be this. What would be the numerical value of the most greatest name in all of creation, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? What's his numerical value? What's the numerical value of the name above all names? The name that is preeminent above all creation. The name that, that demons tremble and that demons uh, fear and that sicknesses must leave and that authority is given in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. His name has a number as well. Now it's rather interesting when you take a look at his name, his name can be seen in three distinct unique ways. Because the three distinct, unique ways of the name of Jesus can be understood as this. Jesus, Jesus Christ, or Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of them have got a unique meaning to them. And the understanding of this is really given to us in the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle was threefold. And in each and every dimension of the tabernacle is really seen another, another understanding, another a comprehension of what the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is seen to be understood. For example, in the outer court, you meet Jesus. Jesus in the outer court is knowing him as Savior. So when you know Jesus or Yahshua, Yahshua is really the name. When uh, 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 People sometimes got a problem with this, but, but, uh, but the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, that the Lord has become my salvation. Matter of fact, why don't you turn to it? I want to show you something beautiful about this. Something beautiful about this. I'll give you the numbers in, 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 as we open this up. But take a look at this. Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. And look at verse 2. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2. 
He says, behold, does everybody have it? It says, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord. Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Now, you read that in the King James, and that's what it reads. Remember what I just said to you, that the moment you translate something, you immediately downgrade the meaning of something, you really lose some beauty behind it? Well, here in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 is a classic case. This is a classic, all right? Because let's read it as, first of all, as it's reading, read in the Hebrew. If you read it in the Hebrew, a beautiful, beautiful understanding of this really comes out. And a beautiful understanding of, of, of the Godhead itself even is revealed in reading this passage. Let's, let's read this in the Hebrew. Now look at what it says here. It says, Behold, God. Now God, in the, in the original Hebrew, when you read it, is Elohim. Okay? Elohim is my salvation. You see that word salvation there? Every time, and the, uh, just pick up a Strong's or a Concordance and you'll immediately see, you'll immediately see the beauty behind it. The word salvation in the ancient Hebrew is actually not a meaning, it's a name. The definition of the word salvation in the Old Testament was not just a word, it was a name. And the name for salvation or the meaning of salvation in the Hebrew Old Testament was the name Yahshua, which is Jesus. So it's saying here, behold, Elohim is my Yahshua. It's relating Elohim to being Yahshua or to relating God and Jesus as being one and the same. Let's read the rest of that verse. He says, I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Now, you see that, that word Lord? It's actually the word name. It's not just a word. It's a name. It's not just a title. It's a name. The name in the Hebrew is Yahweh. And you see that where it says in capital letters in the Greek, in the, you can see it, Jehovah? Actually, it, it, uh, actually, Lord Jehovah is just one name. See that word, Lord Jehovah? It should only be one name put in there, Yahweh. That's it. Oh, Yahweh. You, when, it says, when it says Lord Jehovah, it should only be one name, Yahweh. Lord, Lord is Yahweh, and Jehovah is actually a mistranslation of the real name of Yahweh before Jehovah is, is the Latin version of Yahweh. And why is it a Latin version for? Because in the Latin, they didn't have a Y. So they substituted the J for the Y. They didn't, have, they didn't have an A. So what did they do? They substituted the A and the H for the A. So instead of saying Yahweh, they couldn't say that in the Latin. The closest that they could come to in the ancient Latin was Jehovah. So instead of King James putting Yahweh in there, they, stead, they instead stuck the ancient Latin in there, which was Lord Jehovah, which should have been Yahweh. You say, what's the, what's the big deal? A whole lot big deal. Because, when, again, when, the closer you come to the understanding of that language, the, the, the more greater the understanding becomes concerning the revelation and the awesomeness. You see what I'm saying? The awesomeness of this whole thing really, really jumps out when you really begin to see when it, when it remains untouched. That's why God left it as a dead language for. Because once it's a dead language, you can't change the words anymore. If it's a dead language, you can't touch it. That's why if you, go to, if you go to Israel right now, they're not talking the same Hebrew that you read the Bible with. It's a dead language. And God, God in his wisdom killed the language. So this way nobody could change it. He actually killed the language itself. That ancient language itself, he actually killed it. So this way, no way can anybody come along and ever change it into modern Hebrew. I mean, just in the English language. You ever see what they did to the English language? The first English Bible that was translated in the English language was by a name called John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was the first man that translated the Bible for us from, from English, for, excuse me, from, from Hebrew and Greek into English. But did you ever pick up a Wycliffe Bible? Did you ever read a Wycliffe Bible? If you read the Wycliffe Bible, you'd have more... You, you, you wouldn't even be able to understand what it's saying, even if it was in English. 
I have a White Cliff Bible in my, in my computer at home. I tried reading it, man. The, the, the words, are, I mean, you, the English is there. The English is there. But it's not the same English that we're talking about right now. I mean, if I was to read the English, uh, the English, uh, uh, the, the English Bible from the Wycliffe translation, you would, I'd have to read it to you about four or five times before you really understand what it's saying in, in, in the English that we understand. <coughs> the King James people used the Wycliffe translation, and they also used the Tyndale translation to give us the translation that we have today, which is the King James. So the King James Bible was actually built on two translations. It was built on the Wycliffe translation, which is the ancient English, and then the Tyndale translation. Just to give us what we have today. And I believe that the King James Bible, 1611, is the most accurate translation that we have to this day. I will not use to preach or to, or to study from any of the other translations. Uh, Amplified is good. Uh, if you want to have a good reading, you can pick up uh, New Living Translation. I mean, if you just want to read something as a book... But I mean, if you really want to have God minister something, you really want to study, pick up the King James. The King James, I believe, is the most accurate book that we have. And it's notice that, that, that the, these other two men, a Tyndale, do you know what they did to Tyndale? You, you, you know, just for the Bible that we're holding right now, you, you would be shocked to see what the men had to do just to give us the Bibles that we have today, what they had to sacrifice just to give it to them. I mean, you just take the Bible. I mean, we got a Bible in every corner of the room, don't we? I got, a, I got a Bible in my car. I got a Bible in my bedroom. I got a Bible in my office. I bring a Bible to work. And I don't have just one Bible. I got a few of them there. We got Bibles all over. But you, we, wouldn't, we, you know, we, we don't understand what had to be sacrificed just for them to give us a Bible. The Roman Catholic Church martyred people and put people to the stake for translating books. They were killed. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was a crime against society. Did you hear what I said? A crime against society to translate the Bible into a common language that all men could read. It was a crime. Do you know what they did to Tyndale, which our modern Bible is built upon? You know what they did to Tyndale? They burnt them at the stake. Tyndale was actually betrayed by a friend, or not by, I shouldn't say a friend, he actually was sent in by the Pope himself to try to get, to try to, because they couldn't find Tyndale, because he was translating books all over, the, uh, all, over the, all over the English world at the time, and he was smuggling Bibles into the, into the country, smuggling them in, and they wanted to grab this guy. So what did they do? They, uh, they, they, uh, they, they set up, a, they set up a, a, someone that would in, in, infiltrate his, his Bible, or wherever he was, try to infiltrate and try to find them. And once they did, they gave out the word that they found them. And once they found him, uh, they took, brought him over to the Pope, and he was brought to the stake, and he, they burnt him at the stake. That's what they did to Tyndale. It's amazing how they killed Tyndale, too. Uh, even when I said, it's, it's, it's like how prophetic this is. Because before they burnt him at the stake, they broke his neck. They strangled him and then broke his neck before they burnt him. And do you know something? That was, that was of God, what they did. That was of the Lord. Because the Bible says in the, in, in the book of Exodus that every lamb was to be, every, every jackass was to be redeemed with a lamb. And what they had to do with the jackass was that they had to take the jackass and break its neck in order for the lamb to be redeemed. In order for the jackass to be redeemed, they had to break its neck. So what God was doing by having his neck broken, he was actually confirming that this word was really going to go forth and do its work because the sacrifice was made. But they burnt him at the stake. That's what they did to Tyndale, the book that you're reading, the Bible that you're holding. They took them and they burnt them at the stake. Don't think that whatever truth you have is not going to be tested and you're not going to be persecuted for what you have. You are going to be persecuted, period. If you got any truth that is not conformed to the way people understand it, you will per persecuted for it. Make no mistake about it. Do you know what they did to Wycliffe? John Wycliffe? John Wycliffe never got caught. He died a natural death. But the Roman Catholic Church hated him so much that after he died and was buried, 
they went back to his grave and dug him up. They dug him up. Even after he was buried in the grave, the Roman Catholic Church hated so much what he did in translating the Bible and putting the Bible out to the common people that they went out and they dug his grave. And they took his bones out of the grave. You know what they did to them? They burnt them into ashes. They took his bones. I mean, he had no flesh on his body at all. Complete and total bones. They took his bones and they burnt them. And after they burnt him into ashes, you know what they did? They took the ashes and they, they threw them into the river. They threw them over the sea. And when they did that, when I was reading that and studying that, I said, look at that. That is prophetic as well. Because God said, I will cover the earth with my word as the glory of God covers the sea. I said, and when they did that to him, little did they realize that they were just confirming that the word of God was going to go forth over the whole earth and the glory of God was going to touch all corners of the earth just by them taking his bones and turning them into ashes and throwing them into the sea. They were actually fulfilling the prophetic word that said, my word, will go God will cover the sea. <clears throat> and those are the two men that were as martyrs that actually gave their lives so we could hold the Bible that we have. And they were persecuted tre tremendously for what they did. But how did I get into that? Uh, did, did, did get into what I'm saying here in, in, into, into, into Isaiah chapter 12. Uh, let's read that, that thing again. Look what he says there. He says, Behold, Elohim is my sa salvation, or Elohim is my Yahshua. Yahshua is Jesus. So it's saying Elohim is Jesus. It's saying Elohim is Yahshua. If you turn to the book of Genesis chapter 1, you find that who the creator was when it says in the beginning God, it was he spoke about Elohim. So it's referring to Elohim as being the creator, and not only is he the creator, but he's also Yahshua. He says, Elohim is my Yahshua. Making Yahshua to be God himself. Elohim himself. Now there's much confusion with that term Elohim. Because a lot of people think that Elohim is, is, is relating to other deities. Because that's exactly what Elohim meant. Elohim could have been given, Elohim could have, could have uh, was a name that was given over to any deity that the ancient world worshipped. So Elohim could have been Baal. Baal was called an Elohim. Ashtaroth was called an Elohim. All of the ancient deities of the Old Testament were all called Elohim. So then when it says that Elohim is the one who created all things, then what are we speaking about here? You won't be able to fully understand that, that truth unless you understand that the term Elohim is not only referring to the Almighty, to the Creator, but it's also referring to the family that the Creator has. It's actually referring to the family that Yahweh himself has. So Yahweh is one creator. He is the Almighty. He is one, one unique being, one unique personage, one unique supreme being. But Yahweh, as being the supreme creator, has a family. And that family is called Elohim. This is the reason why all of the other, all of the other pagan deities were also called Elohim as well. Because they themselves had their own families of worshipers. And their families that de were dedicated to their worship. And other kinds of things that were going on. So, so this is the reason why Elohim was used as a common name to denote any deity whatsoever. Because it had to do with the family that they worshipped. Or the family that they were given over to. It's like us today. We've been one people, we we're all human beings, but we all have different families, right? And what, what, what Yahweh did was that when he found a disobedient people, when his own family was disobedient, he gave them over unto other Elohim. He gave them over unto another family of deities that, weren't of, that had nothing to do with him. You understand? I hope I'm making myself clear. Elohim... Is referred to it could be, it could ref, it could have referred to any deity whatsoever. So Baal was an Elohim, Asherah was an Elohim, but the true Elohim was Yahweh. That was the true family of Yahweh. The true family of Yahweh was called Elohim. 
But when he saw his own people being given over to idolatry, he would take his own people and say, okay, you like that so much? I'm going to give you over to that other family. I'm going to give you over to that but other But notice what it says here. It says, Yahweh, uh, Elohim, is my Yahshua. But if you read on, it says, I will trust, I will not be afraid, for Yahweh is my strength and my song. Yahweh also is become my Yahshua. It's saying Yahweh has become my Yahshua. It's calling Yahweh and Yahshua both one and the same being. Yahweh is salvation. Salvation is a name. His name is Yahshua. It's calling Yahweh and Yahshua one and the same being. Give that to the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> It's making Yahweh and Yahshua. Now that, that is its purest language and you can see what happens when you refer it back, bring something back to its purest form, you really get the understanding of it. So it's not saying, uh, you know, your, your Jehovah is my salvation. It's saying Yahweh is Yahshua. That's what it's really saying. It's saying Yahweh is Yahshua. Well, how did I get into that? But... Uh, <clears throat> Let's get back to this whole idea behind the numbers. The numbers have got to do when we speak about the name of Yahshua, which in the, it, actually in the English, when you say Jesus, is another form of the Latin word Yahweh. The same thing, the same thing that they did with, with, with Yahweh is the same thing that they did with Yahshua. They didn't have a Y, they didn't have a y so they took the Y and made it into a J. They didn't have the A-H, so they took the A-H and made it into an E. So when you say Jesus, you're actually speaking the, the, the Latin word that was converted from Yahshua. But Yahshua was actually the most purest form of what that name was. Out from the purest form of what Yahshua was, we come up with Jesus. Jesus means the same thing. It all means salvation. That's what you need to understand. It all means salvation. So I'm not making a tooth and nail thing about what the name is. The name means salvation. But when we speak about his name, the most powerful name that there is in all of creation, the name which is above every name, his name has got a number as well. Now the unique number, the unique name, again, let's get back to what I first said about the tabernacle, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. There's three words to the name of Yahshua. It's Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is seen as Yahshua, is seen as Savior. He is the salvation. <coughs> Therefore, you see salvation when you first enter into the outer court. In the outer court, you meet him as Savior. In the holy place, you meet him as Christ, because the word Christ means anointed one. So it's in the, it's in the holy place that you not only see Jesus, but you see Jesus Christ. You see the anointed one, who is one that can bring the Holy Spirit to you. But then in the Holy of Holies, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord means that he is master, that he is your father, that he is the creator of all things. And indeed, he is the one that's transforming you to become something that you're not. He is Lord. Now, you know, a lot of people in the outer court say he's Lord, but they don't know him as Lord. They just know him as a savior. It's in the outer court where they see him as Jesus. It's in the holy place where they see him as Jesus Christ. But it's in the holy of holies where you see him as the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the outer court, you can know him as Savior. But a lot of people say Lord Jesus Christ, but don't really know him as Lord. You know him as Lord when he transforms you. <coughs> you know what it means to know Yahshua, the Savior, as Lord and Master when he comes into your life and he's able to change you to become like him. That's when you know him as Lord. When you just know him as being your savior, one that saves you, you just know him by his first name, Jesus. But when you know him as the one that anointed you, you know him as Jesus Christ. Because Christ means Christos, it means the anointed. So when you know him as the one that gives you the anointing, he's known as Jesus Christ. But now when you know him as Lord, you know him as the one that Jacob knew, that wrestled with the angel. And when he wrestled with the angel, he became another man, and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Only those that are transformed know his name as Lord. Now, you may know him as Savior. 
You may even know him as the one that who is anointed, the one who gives you healing, the one who gives you gifts, the one who gives you all the good things of life, that the one who gives to you that which proceeds out of the anointing. But it's only those that have been changed in character, changed in their hearts, changed to really, really reflect the image of Jesus Christ that know him as Lord. You don't know him as Lord if you just know him as Savior. You don't know him as Lord if you just know him as the one who gives you the anointing. You know him as Lord when he's able to move into your life and make you become something that you're not. It's only, it's only those that are once Jacob's that become Israel's that know him as Lord. And to know him as Lord means to know him as master. To know him as master means to know him as the one who has literally made you become somebody that you're not. That that's, where we're, that's what we are all pressing into. We're all pressing into a holy of holies experience where we can become transformed. It's not a matter of getting saved anymore. We are saved. We're in the outer court. We know Jesus. We know Yahshua as a Savior. We know that He's the Savior of the world. We know that He died for our sins. It's not a matter of that. And for a lot of us, it's not even a matter of knowing the anointing because a lot of us have tasted of the good gift. We've tasted healing in our lives. We've tasted of the power of God in our life. So it's not even that. What the next step has got to be is that it's got to be a step of transformation, a step where the same step that Jacob took to become Israel is the same step and the same experience that we must take to now know him as Lord. And it's in that experience of knowing him as Lord that we enter into the holy place. Hallelujah. So it's in that place of the Holy of Holies that we're transformed and we're given a new name. That's what the book of Revelation says, doesn't it? It says that in the Holy of Holies, you're given a new name. I'll give you a new name written in glory. Why is he giving us a new name for? Because you've been transformed into something that you were not. You who were once Jacob were now changed to become Israel. You who were once named Abram was now become Abraham. The H with the ham has got the outbreath of God. And only, only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only God, the Holy Spirit, can really change you to become into something that you're not and to become something that reflects His image and is of His image. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only God can do that. Amen. That's when you really, really know what the power of salvation is all about. Now when you just come into the outer court, and experience peace and experience cleansing for the first time in your life and you experience transformation in some measure but you really begin to see him the awesomeness of who God really is God when you begin to see that he's got his hand on everything in your life and that, that nothing in your life comes by accident into your life and that he's purposed everything in your life for one purpose to change you and it became make you become like him so this way you turn around and you even praise God for even the bad things that happen in your life you praise God for the stumblings. You praise God for the mistakes. You praise God for the people that are giving you aggravation. You praise God for everything. Why? Because you know that it's all working together to change you to become like Him. That's when you know Him in the Holy of Holies. Those that know Him in the, holy, in, in the outer court just have experienced salvation and uh, come to understand that He is the Savior, that He has saved them from, saved them from wrath has changed them because, you know, when you get saved, it's a dramatic experience, isn't it? It should be. I remember when I got saved, my cigarettes left me, my cursing left me, my rock and roll records left me, everything left me in that when I got saved. <laughs> but even though I experienced that transformation, that wasn't the full transformation that the Holy Spirit wanted to bring me to. The full transformation that God wanted to bring me to was still yet a work and a process that God wanted to do in my heart after saving me to perfect me so that everything in my life now reflects his image. Hallelujah. And that's what we're all pressing into. We're all pressing into that. So some Christians know him as Jesus. They know him as Yahshua. They just know him as Savior. They know that his, their sins are forgiven, that he died on the cross for their sins. That they're forgiven. That they're saved from wrath. They're not under the judgment of God anymore. They know that he died from the sins, and they will get into heaven. They're saved. Then there are those that are a little bit more thirsty and have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and have received the gifts of speaking in tongues and have received all the other gifts of God and understand that. But then there is something even greater than that. The greatest part is to know 
Him as Lord. And when you know Him as Lord, that everything in your life is in submission to Him. There is nothing in your life that comes by accident anymore. Amen. You begin to understand that you've been predestinated because you are the elect. And that nothing can come into your life except it come first by His acknowledgments. Yes. That's Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does all this mean in terms of numbers? Well, actually, it's got three different sets of numbers. The name Jesus is numbered 888. Okay? The no name Lord is numbered 88. You need to see that all these eights. Eight has got to do with a number concerning new beginnings. I can understand why Yahshua has got three eights to them. Because eight is a number for new beginnings, and it not only speaks about new beginnings, if you put three together, which we're going to speak about in just a moment, it speaks about Yahshua being complete in you. But the name for the Lord Jesus Christ, remember what we say about Lord, that He, is, that he, that he governs everything. That there's nothing that comes into your life by mistake. Everything has got a purpose to it. Everything speaks of His name. That number that speaks about his lordship, Lord Jesus Christ, is numbered 3168. You should write that down. 3168 is actually the number of his name. Now, this is a remarkable number. Remember what I said to you earlier about the numbers? That you can remove the words, and yet if you keep the numbers there, you can see the awesomeness of God, that the numbers where words can't talk, numbers will. Remember when I said that? When I said that you can be, you can say an error, you don't have to understand Chinese, but if you give them a number, they'll understand the number. The numbers remain the same. Well, look at what we do when we, come, when we examine 3168. Just look at what we come up with. We're going to be amazed to see that indeed he is Lord. 3168. If you were to take the earth itself, See the earth, our earth, and put it in a perimeter, the perimeter of an earth, put it like in a box, and measure the circumference of that box, you would come up with three, one, six, eight. What does the Bible say that the earth of the Lord and the fullness thereof it comes out in the numbers? The very perimeter of the entire earth comes out to be three, one, six, eight. If you were to take the orbit of the earth and the moon and draw a big, big circle around them, draw one big orbit around them, you would come up with three, one, six, eight. If you were to take the, the uh, now, now when I say three, one, six, eight, it could be three, one, six, eight feet, it could be inches, it can be cubic feet, but nevertheless, you will see that number there. You will see the three, one, six, eight popping up anytime. So even if it's now in the Hebrew, you need to understand that's something else. It's like 3,168,000. You can drop all the zeros. The important thing is, is that that 3,168 is there. Okay? If you were to take a look at the cities of refuge, and you know what the cities of refuge were? The cities of refuge were cities where a person can run to if they were found guilty or if they were accused of murdering somebody that they didn't really murder, or maybe could have been just an accident by mistake, they could run into those cities and they would be protected. Because you see, there was a law in the ancient language, and the, uh, there was a law that was given by God. The, the, when I say laws in the Bible, these laws aren't just ancient laws, like I just said just now, by mistake. These are laws of Yahweh. They are laws of God. If we had our society run by these laws, our society would not have the problems that they're having right now if they ran according to the laws that are seen in the scriptures. These are not just Jewish laws either. They're laws of Yahweh. They're laws of the Creator. But, but now if you take, a, if you took the city of, cities of refuge and a city, then the Lord said that, that if, let's say I, I uh, by accident, I got into a fight with Jennifer, my wife. And uh, let's just say, by accident, uh, she went to hit me and I, you know, hit her back or something. And by mistake, I accidentally killed her by accident. I didn't really mean it. I didn't really intend it. The Lord said that, that the next of kin could now hunt me down and kill me. That's what it said. 
So by right, her mother-in-law then could come after me and kill me. That would, be the, that would be her right to do so. But if I got into a city of refuge where the high priest was stationed, it would forbid her or any member of the family to come and kill me for what I just did and accidentally killing that person. I would be protected. And that's why it was called the city of refuge. Now, this, is, this applies to us because every one of us are guilty of breaking the law. You see that? Every one of us here are guilty of breaking the law. And of course, we're guilty of breaking the law. Then the law has got a right to hunt us down and accuse us. You see that? And there's a city of refuge for all of us that are accused by law. Maybe some of your best friends come over to you and accuse you. Huh? doesn't have to be those the law. It can be somebody else has gotten in their head. They want to accuse you of something. Well, whatever accusation comes against you, there's a city of refuge that we can go to that can protect us from any accusation so that under the law, we can never be legally, uh, legally uh, put in a place where we can become guilty. We can be freed from guilt. And that's exactly what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does. It frees you from guilt. It, when, the, when the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is applied to your life, it frees you from all sin and transgression. And there is no legal binding at all of whatever sin you did for anybody to accuse you with once you're covered with the blood. That's what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. Amen. It made us legally righteous. Do you hear what I'm saying? It made you legally righteous, so that's why there is nothing in your life now that can stop you from getting to God. That there is an open door now that you can freely get to God, and there is nothing, there is no sin, there is no transgression that will stop you at the door and say, your request cannot be made known, and you cannot come in here because you are filled, you are guilty of sin. What the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does is that it removes guilt, and that, that because it removes guilt, it legally qualifies us now to be as righteous as Yahweh is righteous. And I think I said this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a message beforehand, but what the blood did is that it paid the price for what you owed and what we owed to God. Because every time you sin, you owe God a price. You hear that? Sin comes by way of price. God does not demand repentance when you sin. He wants payments. That's why Adam couldn't repent. He had to give, bring, bring righteous payment to Yahweh for the sin that he had thus done. Repentance would not have satisfied the legal consequences of sin. There must first be a, be a payment made on our behalf for sin before we can repent and before we can even ask for forgiveness. We have been lied to thinking that forgiveness is free. Forgiveness is not free, my friend. It's not a free gift. It's not something that God freely gives out. Oh, you, oh, you sinned? I freely forgive you. There's no such thing. It cost Yahweh the blood of Yahshua to forgive us for our sins. Now, we're standing here, and it's free for us because all we got to do is repent and ask God to forgive us, and immediately we get forgiven. We think it's a free gift, but it wasn't. It cost the price of blood to give us, get us forgiven. That's the price that had to be paid. If the blood wasn't shed, you'd never be forgiven. How are you getting to that? Uh, what was I saying just now? Uh, Yes, city of refuge. That's exactly what the city of refuge was. The city of refuge is a place that we could go to to be protected by the manhunter that, could ha that had a legal right to kill us if we were out in the open. But if we got into the city of refuge, then we were protected. Jesus, Jesus Christ is really our refuge. You hear what I'm saying? His blood is our refuge. That when we commit sin and when we commit transgressions, then we, we can be legally judged and placed under the wrath of God. But because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a city of refuge to go through. The blood is the city of refuge. You see that? Now, when you measure the city of refuge, Ash, every city of refuge, mind you, there were six of them. Every one of them, every single one of them 
Measure that with the, with the length of 3168. Am I giving you the right number? Let me see. Uh, no, yeah, it's 3168, exactly. I said 3168, right? 3168 is the, is the right number. Every one of those cities of refuge were a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they were a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, they measured out the 3168. Here is something really, really beautiful. Look at Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Remember what I just said to you that if you took the earth and placed the earth in a, in, a, in, a, in a square box, it would measure out the 3168. You'd have the name of the number of the Lord Jesus Christ written to it. If you measured the atmosphere above us and went all the way up, it would come out to 3168 as well. You find the number 3168, either in miles or in inches or in cubic feet, the, the 3168 would be there. Look at Micah chapter, what did I say? Micah chapter 5. If I can find Micah, I'd be okay. And where is Micah? Anybody have Micah? Yes. Where, what book does it come after? I'm just going to try to... Right after okay, I got it right here. Thank you. Uh, Micah chapter 5. Look at verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says this. It says, but... but Thou Bethlehem Ephrathite, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. It was prophesied that Christ would be born in Bethlehem, correct? You know where Bethlehem sits? Bethlehem sits on 31.68 latitudes on the earth. He was born on the number of his name. Now take a look at the let take a look at Revelation chapter 21. You know about the new city of Jerusalem. The 3168 comes up all over in creation. Again, it, it, again, if you you'd have to translate the uh, the measurements of it, whether it's feet or whether it's inches or whether it's yards or whatever it else. But if you measure it out, you'll, you'll, you will find this number coming up consistently in anything that has got to do with a creative work on it. That's why he says that his hand, his handiwork is over the whole creation. If you took the, the again, the atmosphere that was sitting under and measure the atmosphere, it would be 3168. If you took all of the, all of the uh, uh, orbits around the planets, the entire circumference of the orbits, I, I, didn't have, I don't have the paper in front of me, but you, you would see the 3168 coming up even in all of the orbits surrounding every planet around our solar system. It would all measure out the 3168. Ezekiel, now take a look at the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is quite interesting. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. <laughs> It gets even better than this because it's quite interesting what you can do with the three numbers, the Hebrew numbers. Not only could you do something with the, he not only could you understand the Hebrew numbers for what they stood, you could also add them up too. And they would give you other numbers that would lead you to other numbers that would lead you to other numbers that would all come back to the same principle. So if you take a look at this 3168, what we're just going to be doing in just a minute, we're going to be adding all the numbers up. We're going to find out where it's going to take us. If you even add the numbers up, it will always bring you back to the same place. So it was, it was divinely given by the hand of God. Now, now look at this in Revelation, what did I say? Chapter 21, when it speaks about the new city of Jerusalem. Uh, take a look at from verse 16. 
and the city lied four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Now notice the measurement that they're using here. They're using furlongs, okay? But when it measures out to furlongs, one furlong, if you were to translate it to our understanding, one furlong, because we don't know what a furlong is. I mean, how many people know what a furlong is? Driving down the road, do you see furlongs? You don't see furlongs, so we have no concept of what furlongs is. But, but one furlong equals 660 feet. Okay? One furlong equals 660 of our English feet. So therefore, if you take 660, 600, if you want to calculate it down to feet, if you take 660 and then multiply it by 12,000 furlongs, because that was, the, that was the depth of the city, all right? You measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs. If you take 660 feet and multiply it by 12,000, you come out with 7,920,000 per side. Remember what I said to you in the Hebrew? You could always drop the zeros and come out as long as you had those numbers there. But, that, but just for the sake of argument, 660 multiplied by 12,000 comes up to 7,920,000. But remember, 7,920,000 would only be the perimeter of one side of the city. Not the entire cubic feet of the city, but only be one side of the city. But if you take 7,920,000 and then multiply that by four, you know what you come up with? 31,680,000 feet. There you have the three, one, six, eight again. Tell me if that's not the mark of God. On the, on the, so it's saying that the, it, that the New Jerusalem itself is measured out exactly to the number of his name. Wow. So we see the earth being measured out with the number of his name. We see the orbit of the earth and the moon. If you put it together, the number of his name, you would see if, the, if, the, uh, if, if you take a look at the... Uh, at the, uh, the uh, the attitude, the, lati the, the height of the atmosphere would equal 3168. You go back to where Jesus was born. He was born on the what? The 31.68 latitude degrees. If you take a look at the uh, uh, solar system itself, it measures out to 3168. You constantly see this number coming up in every aspect of the creation. In every aspect that you turn to, you constantly find this number coming forth, which is what? Which is the number of his name. 3168 is the number of his name. I don't even have time right now. Neither do I have, or maybe, maybe I do. I'll have, just give you a little taste of it. But this even measures out to the height of the pyramid in inches. The pyramid of Giza in Egypt? People don't realize that the pyramid in Egypt was actually a prophetic model given to us concerning dates and times that would occur in the earth that would bring us to the coming of Christ. May I say that again? Not, not the other pyramids, because the other pyramids that were found all over the earth all had idolatrous images in them. But there was something unique in the Great Pyramid of Giza. The Great Pyramid of Giza which is in the Word of God, and I'm going to give it to you just now because it's going to bring us me right where I want to go. But the, but the Great Pyramid of Giza, it was unlike any other pyramid that they found all over the earth. For the reason was this, is because in the Great Pyramid of Giza, they didn't find no idolatry in its walls. They didn't find nothing that you usually found in the other pyramids with the boats and temple treasures and gold. They didn't find nothing in this thing. They found nothing at all. No, no images, no idolatry, no nothing. The only thing they found, strangely enough, was a measurement of what a pyramid inch was. The British inch and the English inch got its derivative from the pyramid inch. Did you know that? The pyramid inch was actually, the, the, the English inch and the, pure, the British inch was actually derived from that pyramid inch. But that pyramid inch was there because it was given to us as a scale of measurements to measure out a specific time and distance, to use distance in the pyramid as a measurement for time when exact dates would occur to foresee the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. One clear example of this was that when they measured it out, they came up with what was called the Christ Triangle. 
which gave, the, gave them the exact date of the date that when Jesus Christ was born. And the exact date that Jesus Christ was born, strangely enough, folks and men and ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't December 25th. The exact thing that that Christ triangle landed on with the distances that, because, because when you enter into the pyramid, you enter into these galleries, you enter into these hallways, and some of them go up, some of them go down, and then there's, there's basically, listen to this, three rooms in the pyramid. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but, but when, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, they measured out the halls and the galleries, it, they were uh, shocked to see when they took that pyramidage, they measured out exactly the line. It was measuring a timeline for them. It was giving them, it was opening up a timeline. The timeline extended right into our modern times. With the beginnings of World War I, World War II, 1917, 1948, all of the big dates that really had a significant uh, impact on our, on our world today was all measured out in these pyramid inches in the pyramid of Giza. There's enough stones in the pyramid of Giza to build 35 empire state buildings. There's enough stones on the pyramid of Giza to circle the earth four times around the equator. What were they doing? What in the world were they doing? Well, listen to this. When God gave uh, Moses the pattern of the tabernacle, he says, I'm going to give you the pattern. What pattern was he using? What do you mean a pattern? You know, if you have a pattern, uh, you ladies would know this. I mean, if, if I say, uh, make me a nice suit, I have to first give you the pattern first, right? You have to have the pattern before you make it. But what was the pattern that Moses had? When he said, I'm going to give you the pattern, we think, well, it's some building up in heaven someplace. No. The pattern that was used to replicate the tabernacle was the pattern that was found on the Great Pyramid of Giza because there were three major rooms in that pyramid. The Queen Gallery, the King's Gallery, and there was some, something else I, I can't quite remember. There was something about that. But it all represented the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The king's chamber was the holy of holies. The queen's chamber was the holy place. And then there was the outer court as well with, that had another room in it as well. The very pattern that God gave to Moses was equivalent to the pattern that was given at the great pyramid of Giza. That was the pattern. You say, now how do you come up with that? Let me tell you what happens. When they finally went into the great pyramid of Giza, all right, when they, when they went in, they finally got into the king's chamber. They were expecting to find just like what they found in the other pyramids. They were expecting to find gold and loot and money and uh, boats and uh, idolatry and all kinds of other things. But guess what they found? They didn't find nothing in there but an empty sarcophagus. They found an empty sarcophagus. Nobody was even buried in it. It was just empty. Do you listen to this? Do you know? that when they measured the interior of the sarcophagus, it came out to the exact perimeter, it came out to the exact measurements of the Ark of the Covenants. The same exact measurements of the Ark of the Covenant were measured, could be measured by the, by the perimeter of the sarcophagus that was found in the Great Pyramid of Giza. It was saying that that sarcophagus, what's a sarcophagus? What's a sarcophagus? Somebody talk to me. What is a sarcophagus? It's an empty coffin, isn't it? It's an empty coffin, isn't it? They didn't find nobody in it. Do you know what the word ark means in the Hebrew? It means just that, coffin. The word ark in the Hebrew, take out your strong concordance when you get home, look at the word ark in the Hebrew, and the word ark in the Hebrew literally means coffin. It literally is telling us this was the place where God was buried. And what did they find in the ark of the covenant? They found the tablets of the law, they found the hidden manna, and they found the, the oh man, I don't want to go into this now. They found the, the, uh, the, uh, the rod that budded. <laughs> One thing just goes to another, goes to another, goes to another. I got to get back to square one again. Do you know that in the tabernacle of Moses, no women were allowed? Only men? Boy, that would have gotten a lot of people angry in our age, wouldn't they? <laughs> Man, they would have been protesting from here to Nebraska. 
<laughs> no woman would have been allowed. No woman were allowed in the tabernacle. You say, no, why did God do that? Why did God do that and allow the woman not to be in the tabernacle of Moses? Because everything in the tabernacle of Moses, all the words that were related to the sides, to the curtains, they were all feminine. <laughs> they were all feminine. All the words were feminine. Meaning God was saying that this tabernacle here, which is an image of the body, it was an image of the dwelling place of God, which you are, well, how can that building ever reflect my image? I mean, look at what I look like. I got arms, I got legs, I got hands, I got feet, I got I got a body. That that building evidently doesn't look like it has a body, but all the words that were applied to it had to do with members of the physical body, and they were all female in nature. God was saying that tabernacle is actually my bride, my lady, my woman, my church, my called out ones, my elect, which is feminine. That's why no woman would have allowed in there because it would have been like a lesbian relationship. <laughs> so God says, keep.